Hey guys, today we are breaking down week 10, a ton of amazing matchups that we want to get in here at Twin Takes Fantasy Football. With week 10, depending on the st- uh, setup of your league, you either have four or five weeks left before the playoffs, so this is crucial crunch time. Get your team right, get ready for the playoffs, and make that final playoff push to put you up in a position to win your league. So a ton of stuff to break down here. Also want to say thank you so, so much for uh, all the support that I've received with my first week uh, in my partnership with Sleeper. It's been an incredible journey. Um, so again, I will be continuing to do that every single week. Go uh, watch this video, then go check out all my player breakdowns over at Sleeper HQ on all platforms, including YouTube. Um, and as this channel continues to grow, both here and with Sleeper, hit that like button, subscribe as well, and I will cue the intro. Welcome back into Twin Takes Fantasy Football, guys. And I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say this is one of the most important weeks in fantasy football. Trade deadline is incoming. You have four or five weeks until the playoffs. You really kind of have to make that final push. Um, So every matchup now is just so crucial to get it right. And that's why we're going to break down a ton ton of fun matchups today. And I think, uh, not even an exaggeration to say that these matchups are probably the most exciting now that we know what teams actually are. We've gotten some injuries out of the way. We've seen the trajectory of some teams stock up, some teams stock down. Um, So going to dive into all that today. One thing I do want to touch on, though, um, still, I know I'm wearing this and this, but I'm not a Dallas fan. Just what happens when you live in the area for about eight years, uh, you just accumulate Dallas merchandise. So um, that's the outfit for today, but you know, not my NFL team. Uh, Still waiting for one of you guys to guess which team I am a fan of, but it's not the Cowboys. That's your first hint, but let's get into the first matchup that I'm looking forward to. And that's going to be Seahawks at the Buccaneers. Uh, Currently the Bucks are favored by two and a half points. Um, I think that line is misleading. Uh, I think the Seahawks should be favored and the Seahawks will win. So if you want to win some money, just go money line on the Hawks there. Uh, Over under is 44 and a half points, which leaves Seahawks projected point total of 21 and a half and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers projected point total of 24. I think the Seahawks will exceed their point total, and I don't think the Buccaneers will reach anywhere close to 24 points. But this is a really um, interesting matchup from the NFL side. It's a matchup of the current clubhouse leaders in both the NFC West and the NFC South. So a win here for either club is going to be very, very big for each club's respective title push of their respective division title. But for fantasy, this should be a really interesting game. Uh, for Seattle, ever since Rashad Penny went down with the injury in week three or week four, Kenneth Walker has been an absolute buzzsaw, tearing it up for fantasy, been a waiver wire warrior, or at least a stash that has paid off um, when you drafted him in the seventh, eighth, ninth round. Uh, but I think this is kind of where that magical run for Kenneth ends. Um, he's going to go up against a very stout defensive line for the Buccaneers in uh, Vita Vea and the rest of that O-line. So I think his upside is a little bit capped. I expect him to still get good fantasy production, but I expect more of a Najee Harris type game rather than a Joe Mixon type game. Um, He'll still get it done, but I think this is where that magical run kind of crashed a little bit back down to reality. But it doesn't mean I'm not out on the Seahawks. Uh, While the Buccaneers are really good on the defensive line, they're an absolute liability in coverage. Devin White is a big name, but he is an absolute liability when it comes to anything outside of rushing uh, rushing the passer. Um, and just their secondary has not played up to the standards that they've been used to in years past. So I expect Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf to absolutely torch the secondary. And uh, Geno Smith, with his current um, big-time throw rate, with the way he passes the ball, with the way he plays, I generally expect them to win the ball by throwing the, uh, throwing the ball down the field. And Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf do both have uh, pretty good games. For the Bucks, if they want to remain competitive in this game, they will need to figure out the run game, an area of their offense that has been severely lacking. Um, this Seahawks defense is actually really good in the secondary, led by Defensive Rookie of the Year candidate in Tariq Woolen, uh, their fifth-round pick, who has been uh, tremendous so far, shown amazing growth, and been an absolute uh, stellar lockdown corner, and I believe leads uh, all rookies in interceptions at this current moment. Um but without Jamal Adams and their defensive line, it is still lacking quite a bit. They didn't make any moves at the trade deadline. Uh, they are still susceptible to the running game, which we've seen in a few weeks past from the fantasy aspect. So this is where Leonard Fournette needs to get right, or maybe even this is where Rashad White takes over for that backfield. We've seen him have a little bit more juice, a little bit more get up and go, um, a little bit more burst on the ground when he's finding holes. Uh, so if the Buccaneers want to have any sort of chance to make competitive in this game, they will need to find themselves and find their ground game. Um, 
and that's what I'm really paying attention to in this game. So it's a gut check start for either uh, for Leonard Fournette. I don't know if I have the balls to start Rashad White just yet, but um, again, something very, very critical to pay attention to. So let's get into our must starts. Uh, obviously, Geno Smith, he's currently seventh uh, in fantasy points at the QB position. And like I said, in order for them to win, I think they're going to have to absolutely decimate this Buccaneer secondary. Uh, leads to a very good game for Geno. DK and Tyler Lockett as well will be guys that you have to must start. I think they're going to both have great games. Kenneth Walker, um, despite his upside being capped uh, with that defensive line there, still is a must start. Uh, Leonard Fournette, Mike Evans, and Chris Godwin are the uh, off uh, pieces from the Buccaneer side that you know will be must starts in this game. You're probably starting Tom Brady uh, just because with the landscape of fantasy, He's a decent quarterback. He'll get you a good baseline. Doesn't have that upside we've seen in years past, but you know, um, you're probably going to start him if you don't have any better options. And then in desperation, uh, obviously, the Seattle tight ends, Noah Fant, Will Disley have a knack for the end zone. Uh, we saw Noah Fant actually become a tight uh, top ten tight end uh, last week when he found the end zone. So you know, if you don't, if you're really struggling at tight end, those guys can be done. And then desperation, uh, Rashad White, like I said, this could be the game where he breaks out, where they could give him this workload uh, to go off. Um, so if you need a really ballsy uh, upside play, Rashad White will be your guy. And like I said, I expect Seahawks to win this game. Bet money line, get yourself a, a nice little uh, chunk of chat, a uh, chunk of cash from that. So let's go into our second game. It's going to be Lions at the Bears. Uh, currently, Chicago is favored by two and a half points, um, which with an over under currently at 48 and a half points. So this leads to our projection point total for Detroit at 24 and Chicago's projected point total is 26 and a half. And just because both these clubs have losing records doesn't mean we won't highlight the matchup. But let's be honest, all eyes are on this matchup because of the most recent fantasy darling in Justin Fields. He's been on an absolute tear over the past three weeks. QB three over that span with QB five, QB5 and QB1, um, respectively, in those each three weeks. It looked like a slow start up there in Chi-Town, but uh, things have finally started to click with Eber Flus and company. They're leaning into Justin Fields' skill set and using his legs, uh, drawing up a ton of designed run for him to keep defensive guess defenses guessing, uh, more of an offense similar to what Greg Roman and the Ravens run for Lamar Jackson. Uh, but, you know... I appreciate that Eberflus has kind of opened up his mind to this idea and has adapted the offense, but let's not give all the credit to Eberflus because it definitely, um, a lot of credit should go to Fields and what he's been doing on the field. Uh, he looks like a completely rejuvenated man. Um, he looks very, very confident in the pocket. He's going through his progressions, not just bailing out at the first progression. He's making big time throws. He's using his legs to get out of situations instead of panicking. Uh, everything we wanted to see from the second year quarterback. Um, and also this should be amplified by the 30th worth defense uh, with the Detroit Lions. But, you know, the Bears, the Bears are have a losing record for a reason. They, the Lions aren't the only bad defense in this matchup. The Lions are pretty bad as well. And they also got rid of Roquan Smith and Robert Quinn at the deadline, which I don't think were bad moves, but it's just going to make this bad defense even worse, especially against the run game. Um, so look for the multitude of offensive weapons with the Lions to take full advantage. Even with the limited uh, DeAndre Swift, he should be effective in the passing game. Jamal Williams has shown the ability to step up and be just as effective, um, especially with Swift in a limited role and this 31st ranked uh, rushing defense of the Bears. Jamal should be just fine. And again, we're all just holding our breath. Uh, without TJ Hawkinson, Amon Ra uh, should have a larger target share in this offense. And we saw the potential that he could uh, have in week two when he went off for 30 plus fantasy points. We saw his ability on display at the end of last year. So we're just holding our breath, waiting for him to get back to those levels. Um, and without TJ Hawkinson and against this horrible defense, I think he has the opportunity to do this. I'm anticipating fantasy points galore uh, in this matchup and trying to get as many pieces as I can. So as for the must plays, as you must know, Justin Fields, uh, David Montgomery, Darnell Mooney, Jared Goff, Jamal Williams, and Amon Ra St. Brown. Um, all those guys, uh, leaders at their position. Yes, Jamal Williams is the running back one right now. So I'm playing all the running back one, wide receiver one, and quarterback ones uh, in this matchup. We move to the probably play. Uh, DeAndre Swift, again, he's still going to be limited by that injury. So if you have a better option, I wouldn't be totally opposed to him, you benching him for this week. Uh, Cole Kmet is a probably play after his performance last week, and we see him getting more involved in this offense. And Khalil Herbert, especially against this uh, 30th ranked Lions defense, he should be involved. He has a, he has demonstrated the ability to be the goal line back for this offense, um, so he will get those uh, touches inside the five yard instead of David Mon uh, Montgomery, and should be. Uh, useful for fantasy if he can't find the end zone and in desperation you can always go with the uh, lower end wide receivers and dj chark and chase claypool again i think this is going to be a very very high scoring game 
Um, but ultimately, uh, Chicago probably will be pulling this one out. Uh, number three, the game that I want to talk about here and really highlight is Chargers at the 49ers. Uh, San Francisco is favored by seven points, and that's why I think that's the largest spread that we've had in a highlighted game here. Um, with the over-under at 45.5 points, it leads Los Angeles to be projected 19 points, and San Francisco have projected 26 points. And I think that's inflated. Uh, I just can't quit the Chargers, man. Excuse me. I think they're just so uber talented and one of the best teams in the AFC. And in my mind, this is still a matchup of NFL juggernauts. The Chargers have just been absolutely devastated by injury luck um, and being ripped to shreds, whether it's on the defensive line, in the secondary, or in the wide receivers of Little Keenan Allen and Mike. Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. Um, Justin Herbert is still one of the best QBs in the NFL. Don't get it twisted. Yes, he's had a bad year, but hello, guys. Come on. He's had rib da- or broken ribs for the past four weeks, and this is not a minor injury. This is one of the most painful injuries um, that you can play through and deal with because it's just so involved. Even if you breathe in pretty heavily, it's going to uh, shock the nerves around there. So give credit to Justin Herbert. He's absolutely a dog for playing through this injury. That's insanely painful. Um And we got comments from Brandon Staley saying that, yeah, they've been limiting the offense to accommodate for the injury to Herbert. Yeah, they've been limiting it um, to make sure to protect him a little bit more. But he's very, very close to 100%. And obviously, we don't know this for sure, but that's what Brandon Staley is saying. And he's going to open up the offense uh, once again and try to get Herbert back to what we've seen in years past as he approaches 100% with his health. Um, So, yeah, very much looking uh, looking forward to seeing what this offense looks like when it's completely opened up. And, again, we talk about, have to talk about injuries here. Mike Williams obviously won't play, and Keenan Allen is a game-time decision. Um, I still don't think, even if Allen is active, he won't play a full game, given that he's uh, still recovering, trying to come back and still be 100% from that hamstring injury. But that's okay because Joshua Palmer is that dude. He proved last week that he can shoulder uh, the wide receiver one burden, putting up over 100 yards on eight catches. Uh, and Gerald Everett has proven that this by age, he's still a very, very talented tight end and will be crucial to this offense going forward. Oh, and they have some random guy named Austin Eckler, who's I think, he's pretty special at running back, right? Um, for the 49ers, I'm actually very excited to see how they perform with both Debo and CMC in the lineup. Uh, with CMC's insane game uh, two weeks ago, Debo was sidelined with an illness, so uh, it should be very interesting. I'm kind of expecting them to line up in some 21 personnel sets with both CMC and Debo in the backfield. Like, how terrifying is that? What defense is stopping both Debo and CMC lined up in the backfield? Uh, I can just imagine all the linebackers pissing down their leg <laughs> trying to tackle and figure out which one of these guys is getting the ball. Um, should be uh, some very, very creative offensive sets for Shanahan and company over there. Obviously, there are a ton of mouths to feed in this offense with Kittle and Ayuk also both playing at a very high level. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to observe how that snap share is distributed. Uh, is it pretty even across the board? Does Ayuk's production go down? Is Kittle more involved in a blocking role? Um, but to be fair, with this horrific defense from the Chargers, they just can't do anything against the run. Uh, there's a chance at CMC that uh, Kyle Shanahan is going to I know for a fact Kyle Shanahan will lean heavily into the run, and there's a chance that CMC goes off for a Mixon-esque week uh, this week against that Chargers defense. So let's go. Must-starts are pretty obvious here. CMC, George Kittle. Uh, Kittle, I will say, has been tight end six, tight end one, and tight end six the past three weeks. So uh, he's playing excellent football right now. He is, has top five upside on the week every single week, so you must start him. Uh, Debo coming back from hel- uh, in, from illness, especially after the bye. I will be starting Debo. He's just that talented. You can't not start him. Uh, Herbert, Allen, pending health. Joshua Palmer is a must start regardless of Allen's health. And Austin Eckler. Uh, the probably start aspect is going to be uh, Gerald Everett. Uh, if Allen is out, then Gerald Everett becomes a must start. But, you know, uh, if Allen is healthy, then you can downgrade uh, Gerald Everett a little bit. And then obviously Brandon Ayuk, I think he's going to have a very limited role uh, with both with all Debo, Kittle, and CMC in the lineup. So I'm downgrading Brandon Ayuk just a little bit. And then in, in desperation, you can throw in Jimmy G, uh, but I would be looking for options elsewhere, like maybe a dual threat quarterback. Um, so let's get into quick hits slash best of the rest. And the first, we got to talk about the game tonight. Uh, Falcons at Panthers with Atlanta favored by three points. Uh, we saw a shootout from these guys a couple weeks ago, and I was hoping to get to the game, but apparently they're going to be playing in a hurricane tonight. So uh, very limited from a passing perspective. Uh, throw in CPAT, uh, Deonta Foreman, Chuba Hubbard, Tyler Algier. It's going to be very much a ground-based game. Um, that's what happens when the, in these wet, wet and rainy conditions. 
nothing happens uh, through the air. Catching the ball is hard. Throwing the ball is hard. Holding onto the ball is hard. So uh, I imagine it's going to be a huge run fest. And I could totally imagine this game hitting the over and being not much of anything, unfortunately. Um, so... I'm just going to fade all pass catchers in this option. And, uh, you know, Patterson, Algier, a lot of those guys, I think, should be available as the game scripts will be run the ball all day, every day. Um, Jaguars at Chiefs. The next game we're going to hit on nine and a half points is but Kansas City is favored by. And I think that was generous for the Chiefs. I think they should be favored by double digits or more. Uh, they should absolutely torch the Jags. And the only Jags assets I really have any interest in here is Etienne and Kirk. I'm not going to get too cute uh, trying to go up against uh, one of the best teams in the AFC. Uh, for the Chiefs, this is Clyde Edward Lair's bounce back week. I know he's going to have uh, a good week. He will be on the ground. He will get more involved in the offense. Uh, I just have confidence starting him this week. Um, I know he's been riding the bench. He's been pretty uh, poor after his uh, monstrous first three weeks, but this is where he gets back involved. He will find the end zone. He will be fantasy relevant. Um, otherwise, just start your normal Chiefs. Uh, number three. Browns at the Dolphins. Miami is currently favored by three and a half uh, points, and Dolphins are currently a bottom five run defense. So hopefully Kevin Stefanski over the bye week took his head out of his rear and starts utilizing Kareem Hunt, who is uber talented um, after he failed to trade Hunt at the deadline. Uh, this is a bottom five run defense. Use your best two weapons, which are both runners. Use Nick Chubb. Use Kareem Hunt. They should both be very, very effective uh, in this matchup. We saw what the Chicago Bears uh, did to... Miami last week. So um, again, Hunt is a real gut check start this week, but I would have confidence starting him uh, after a few disappointing weeks. And um, on the on the Dolphins side, I'm taking a wait and see approach to how the Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson Jr. Uh, timeshare plays out. I don't really have confidence starting either one this week. Um, but again, just wait and see, see who gets some, see who's more involved in the past game, see how it kind of develops over the next week or two. And, uh, you know, Waddle and Tyreek to the moon otherwise. Next game, let's talk about Texans. Excuse me. Texans at Giants. Uh, both of these running backs are top 10 fantasy assets. You play them regardless of matchup. But I do want to highlight one other person here, and this was almost my running back game of the week, except for the fact that this is the Wandale Robinson game. This is where he breaks out. Without Kadarius Tony in the lineup, without Sterling Shepard, Kenny Galladay is irrelevant. Wandale Robinson, I just got this feeling in my bones that Wandale is going to have himself a game this week. Start him. Um... Against this awful Texans defense, Saquon will get his, Daniel Jones will get his, but Wandale would be heavily involved in this offense, and I think this is where we start seeing him uh, become more involved as a wide receiver one going forward. Pick him up off waivers. He should be there because they were on a bye last week. If you need a spot start at wide receiver, Wandale will be that dude. Um, Next one, Colts at Raiders. Vegas is favored by six and a half. Should be way more. Should be way more just based on what the Colts have been going through the past two weeks. Uh, the Raiders have to win this game because the Colts are an absolute joke at this point. Um, I understand it's tempting to start Pittman and Taylor against the bottom five defense in the Raiders, but just do not do it. Don't do it, dude. Uh, you cannot start any Colts because uh, this is an O-line that is awful. This is a rookie QB that looks like he's pissing down the leg every time the ball is snapped to him. And a coach who has zero coaching experience in the NFL or in college. His, going, his game team will be rudimentary, and I expect even the abysmal uh, Raiders should sniff out uh, any game plan and stop it pretty effectively. Um, again, this is a train wreck on the Colts. Get out now. Get out maybe start Jonathan Taylor as a flex if you're desperate. But like, I'm so, so, so out on any Colt right now. Cowboys at Packers. Another game is just don't play any Packers. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. It's tempting. Do not do it. Uh, they are so injured, so unmotivated, so defeated that I feel gross. Anytime I try to put in anyone from my lineup in the Packers, I think about AJ Dillon and then I just, you know, throw up a little bit of my mouth and I move on with my life. Um, Rogers will get, that's my hot take. Rogers is going to get benched in this game. Uh, we're going to see Jordan Love get thrown in uh, probably in the second half, and we'll see Aaron Rodgers uh, pout on the sideline. Uh, Aaron Jones will not out right now, not testing it out. He will miss time, that high ankle sprain. He's in a walking boot. I expect two to four weeks missed from him. Um, and I challenge anyone to name three offensive weapons on this roster outside of AJ Dillon that is not injured right now. Waiting. Waiting. Um, I don't think you can, and that's why... Even in a normal matchup, I would not be playing them. And this is against the top five defense in the Cowboys that's led by Micah Parsons. So, yeah, this is going to be a bloodbath for the Packers. Um, two more games going to hit here in this section. Uh, Cardinals at Rams. Lam uh, Rams are currently favored by three points. I think, they're, I think the Cardinals are actually going to take this game. So another underdog that I'll be betting on. Um, I just love Rondale Moore in this matchup. The Rams have had 
when it comes to their uh, defensive strategy or just their strategy as a whole, it's really the stars and scrubs approach, which means Jalen Ramsey is the number two graded DB on the season across the entirety NFL. But if you look at the rest of that uh, secondary, whether it's cornerback or safety, uh, none of them are even scraping the top 60. Uh, so really a huge downgrade on anyone that's not facing Jalen Ramsey. Um, Obviously, Ramsey is a primarily a boundary corner, and he plays on the outside, which is where 66% of his snaps have come from uh, this season. So I expect him to shadow DeAndre Hopkins for most of the game, which will allow Rondell Moore to go to work and feast from the slot um, this week. Uh, that Rams defense is not as scary as, anyone, as everyone thought coming into the season. Last game, Monday night, Commanders at Eagles. Philadelphia favored by 11 points. Should be another bloodbath uh, and another great week. Uh, another great matchup for the Eagles. And once again, I'm coming to you saying week after week that you have to start all of your Eagles assets. But once again, you will be disappointed because there will be someone that will inevitably be a disappointment for fantasy because there's just way too many mouths to feed in this offense. Last week, Devonta Smith was the uh, disappointment as a lot of the targets uh, and the touchdown went to uh, Dallas Goddard. And that's how they really utilized uh, their offense there. The only saving grace is that this is a Monday game. This is a Monday night game. And this is actually the one good times like one times you're thankful for Monday night game because you can easily pivot out of the situation depending on what your team's needs so let's say you have Devonta Smith in your roster okay you're getting through uh Sunday things are a little bit dicey you're a little bit behind you need a boom or bust play to win you the week you need a guy that it doesn't matter if he gets he, 10 points is not going to do it you need a guy that's going to get 20 points and has a high upside cool you leave Devonta Smith in because he has that uh op- opportunity to get you a top 20 wide receiver week um but you know if you're good. Uh, you're, you're cruising. You're up by 20 points going into Saturday, Sunday night. You don't need to worry too much. You just need a good, safe floor play. Then pivot elsewhere. You don't need to take a risk. Um, so that's when you just that's when you kind of get into team management, roster management, uh, identifying what you have uh, and what um, what type of players will suit you the strategy to win the game, and then obviously make that decision on. Um, uh, Monday night. And then the last thing I want to mention about this game, Antonio Gibson, sneaky good flex play. Uh, Le- Eagles are last in the NFL on EPA per yards on the ground to running backs. So with Antonio Gibson still having the majority of the snap share at the running back position with over 50%, sneaky good flex play. I don't have any pro- uh, problem starting him this week. Um, so now after we've wrapped all that up, time to talk about our matchup of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! All right, so this week we're going to be highlighting the Vikings at the Bills. Buffalo is currently favored by five points, and we have a ton to get into with this matchup. Current over-under is set at four, 45 and a half points. So Minnesota is currently projected at 20 and a half points, while Buffalo is projected at 25 points. Now, these are two of the top seven-ish teams in the NFL right now, depending on how yeah, you view the Vikings. Um, but we know the we know the Bills are legit. Like we know they're a legit team and they're but there are still questions about the authenticity of the Vikings and their record, if it truly reflects how good they are. So um listen, they're a seven one team, but this is the time where it's like, hey listen, if, if they can compete, if they can run with the Bills, then they're legit. If they get blown out here, then okay, maybe the record was a little bit of a farce, but this should be uh, a really good measuring stick for the Vikings. But the critical aspect of this game is going to be the health of Josh Allen and his uh, UCL injury. We have not heard a, conf- a confirmation about what the extent of that UCL is, and we've heard a ton of multiple reports coming out that it's a minor sprain, it's a larger sprain, there's more issues on it, it's impacted the ulnar nerve, which is really concerning. Um, so this is, I'll, I'll just kind of go into a breakdown just because I've had personal experience with UCL and ulnar nerve injuries. Uh, and I just wish that, uh, the, the Buffalo bills will come out and give you an extent of what their damage is to his elbow, because then we can make a more accurate uh, prediction. But right now, um, this is a very, very concerning injury for me. And I think he will be missing this game. I know for a fact, he'll be missing this game. He probably will be out multiple weeks. That is because this is so important, um, of an injury that uh, obviously the injury I had to my ulnar nerve was very, very severe. I uh, had to have major uh, reconstructive surgery on the elbow. It took me about 12 months rehab. But there are two reasons why this is very important for a quarterback who does this motion a lot. So uh, first off, uh, every time the elbow in and of itself, the ulnar nerve in the UCL, there's very little protection. Ugh, again, the human body is weird and that uh, that nerve and that ligament is very little protection. So every time you extend your elbow like this from less than 90 degrees to over 180%, that those, both of those ligaments and the nerve will rub against the inside of your elbow right here. Um, 
And if there's any sort of damage, any sort of uh, lesions, any sort of wear and tear, then it's incredibly pain painful. And if it does go to um, a nerve issue, if the nerve has been infected whatsoever, every time you have that nerve snap across that bone, you will get shocks and immense pain down the forearm, uh, which is really, really uncomfortable to deal with. Um, secondly, why this is so important as a quarterback is the only nerve in the UCL control the grip of your hand primarily in these three fingers. That's actually how my mind was diagnosed because the grip strength here was so much less than the grip strength in my other hand. Now, what does this mean for football? Okay, well, if this is a dominant hand, the ball he throws and he, when he throws, holds onto the ball with, that means it's going to be a lot easier for him to fumble the ball, a lot easier for defenders to knock the ball out. And it's going to be a lot harder for him if he can't grip the ball. It's going to be easier to slip out as he makes those throws, especially if he has shock waves or any radiating pain up his form from that extension. Um, so his accuracy down the field will be greatly impacted. Um, so again, an injury that I am keeping a very, very close eye on. Uh, so now that I did that whole tangent on the injury. I'll try to keep the rest of the segments uh, short. So again, I'm fading Gabe Davis just because of the fact that by my understanding of this injury, that his uh, accuracy and strength down the field will be impacted. And that's where Gabe Davis feasts. So going to uh, fade Gabe, Gabe entirely. Uh, and then on the Viking side, you know, you, you start and play the big three cook, Jefferson Cousins and this is probably the best defense that they will face since the Eagles in week two so it should be again a very good test of their offensive capabilities and give you a good measuring stick going forward so I know that wasn't exactly the fantasy discussion that we normally have in this matchup of the week segments but I thought that was very very important to address as someone who has dealt uh, with ulnar nerve injuries and UCL injuries pre uh, previously and give a little bit of my take on that inj uh, injury so let's talk about must starts must starts got it Dalvin Kirk uh, Jefferson we talked about the big three makes like make it very easy for us fantasy players um josh allen stefan diggs and devin singletary will be the must starts from uh the buffalo bill side and the probably starts uh again gabe davis is a little bit downgraded here because of i have concerns about josh allen's ability to throw the ball down field uh tj hawkinson as he gets incorporated into this vikings offense i think he should be an upgrade over what they had previously with irv smith and he's probably start there dawson knox and adam thielen are also going to be in your probably starts as well uh no desperation starts just because i think um hopefully if all plays out well if allen's health is good and if things play out the way i hope they do uh it should be a very high scoring game so uh, you want to start a lot of assets from this matchup. And um, again, hard to tell if Josh Allen misses this game, which I think he will. Vikings, Vikings should be able to uh, Vikings should be able to take this game for sure. So that's going to wrap up my matchup of the week. Again, every week I'm over uh, at sleeper HQ on um, YouTube and all their platforms, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, Twitter, all that fun stuff, and the list of players that I'll be highlighting uh, this week. So if you want detailed analysis on each one of these players and where I think they fall up in their lineup, it's going to be Rondale Moore, Zach Ertz, Darrell Henderson, Allen Robinson, Josh Palmer, Gerald Everett, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, Curtis Samuel, Terry McLaurin, Antonio Gibson, and Devontae Smith. I talked a little bit about those players here, but I go really, really in-depth over there on the Sleeper channel, so go check uh, that out. Go uh, like the video, comment, give it a watch. It really helps out um, with this partnership. And with that being said, um, time for one last parting thought before week 10. You know, there's only one thing that I'm not clear about. Actually, uh, there is one thing. One other thing. All right, guys. This is week 10. Trade deadlining is fast approaching for uh, fantasy football. Most of these trade deadlines do occur in week 11. So you got one more week uh, to put together um, trades and evaluate your roster. Listen, it's nine weeks in. You should know... Uh, you should know the strengths of your roster. You should know the weaknesses of the roster. And now is the perfect time for a trade. People will feel the heat of trying to compete down their neck, or they should feel, um, you know, the heat of the trade deadline breathing down their neck. So people are now more motivated to trade than they are earlier in the season. And also, it's perfect time because it's far enough removed from the draft that people forget about draft capital. Um, you know, Jonathan Taylor would have, uh, you know, required a king's ransom to pry away at the beginning of the year. Now, uh, I would personally say that. Damian Pierce is probably worth more than Jonathan Taylor, and you could probably trade him for like a wide receiver two option. Uh, so uh, 
people forget about draft capital uh, and the investment and the glitz and glam of the draft. They're no longer uh, looking at the draft through rosy colored eyes. They kind of are more realistically invested in what the actual season's going on. So you can make more fair deals based on production rather than projection. Um, and also when you make these deals, you are close enough to evaluate your team. Okay, do you need to win now to make the playoffs or are you in a good enough position where you can go in and actually um, say, all right, this player is playing great right now, but has a terrible matchup for fantasy. Maybe I want to go out and trade for Michael Carter, who has the easiest running back schedule. He's not he's not expensive whatsoever, but he does have the easiest running back schedule uh, throughout the playoffs in weeks 15, 16, and 17. So make sure you're taking into account and setting yourself up well for the playoff run uh, if you have that luxury. So um, if you have any trade questions, drop them down below. Uh, hit me up on Twitter at, twi- at TwinTakesFF. Uh, go check out the sleeper content and... Uh, Good luck to everyone in week 10, and I will see you back here next week.